Hey, uh, thank you everyone for attending this session. Um, we're going to be talking about human genomics data sharing and we're going to be thinking about whether we are fair yet. My name is Bernie Pope and I am the Associate Director for Human Genome Informatics at the Australian Biocommons. Um, and I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the lands upon, we which, of, upon which we live and work. In this case, in, in my particular case, this is the Wurundjeri people. Okay, so this session is about the Human Genome Informatics Initiative, which is a part of the Australian Biocommons. Um, it is a core Australian Biocommons activity designed to identify and adopt leading technology to maximise benefit from human genomics data in Australia by doing the following things. We are trying to remove barriers between researchers, their data and analysis resources. We are facilitating data sharing across data holdings for greater scale and analytical power. We are connecting and harmonizing national and international research efforts. And we are ensuring that data is accessed appropriately within ethical, legal and privacy standards. And all of these things fall under the general banner of being fair, which is being findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. How are we achieving these aims? We are achieving these aims in the Human Genome Informatics Initiative at the Australian Biocommons by doing the following things. We are identifying research community needs and gaps in current practices. We're establishing and supporting a community of national partners to work towards consensus and adoption of infrastructure and technology. We are leading flagship projects that build foundational infrastructure in a model that is reusable by design. And we are collaborating with and providing leadership on national projects with a common goal. Today, we are very thrilled to have the following three speakers to present to you. Um, each of these speakers is a leader in their field and a recognized expert in the area of human genome informatics. Um, the speakers are in the order that they're going to present. Associate Professor Mark Cowley, um, the Computational Biology Group Leader from the Children's Cancer Institute. Mr. John Scullin, who is Head Projects and Managed Services at Australian Access Federation. And Professor Peter Meikle, who is the head of the systems biology domain, co-lead of the obesity and lipids program and head of the metabolomics laboratory at the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute. I will now pass you over to um, Associate Professor Mark Cowley, who will present his topic on, in implementing a pediatric cancer genomic data commons. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, Bernie. Uh, it's a real pleasure to talk to you today about some of the work we've been doing with biocommons. I think our first conversations with BioCommons started almost three years ago, um, and it's been quite an exciting ride. And I'm excited to tell you a little bit about some of that work today. So I'm, I'm here presenting really on behalf of Marie Wong and Camille uh, from my team, who largely did a lot of the work on this particular project. So uh, yeah, I'll get into it. So just to frame the, the talk, really, we're at Children's Cancer Institute. So we, we care a lot about childhood cancer. Uh, in the Western world, childhood cancer is the leading cause of disease-related death in children and young adults. And in Australia, that means about a thousand new cases of, of babies, infants, adolescents, and young adults uh, with cancer each diagnosed each year. Fortunately, thanks to lots of medical research for 60 years, it's no longer a death sentence and eight out of 10 children will survive. But I think we can all agree that the two out of 10 uh, that don't survive is worth investing a lot of effort and energy into. And these are the high risk kids who either don't have a good treatment option at diagnosis or fail to respond to their treatment entirely. Um, every patient's genome is unique and that's really important because it, we think that helps, uh, that impacts how we diagnose them, how we treat them, how we predict which ones will do badly how we identify at-risk family members. Um, so for us, putting a genetic lens on this, it's really important to make, make headway here. Um, the Zero Childhood Cancer Program is a joint initiative of the Children's Cancer Institute and the Kids Cancer Center, Sydney Children's Hospital Network. And this is a national precision medicine program that obviously aims from the bold name to reduce the incidence of this terrible disease down to zero um, and work out how to treat these patients better and how to importantly as more and more children get cured how to reduce the side effects from their treatment next slide please Ben. 
So moving more to the topic of today's conversation really about genomic data commons is that Xero is a national network. Uh, there are actually nine pediatric cancer hospitals around the country and we're working on getting the ninth on board in, in Hobart, but, but traditionally eight sites are all engaged with this program. Rare diseases, despite being the leading cause of death, are still uh, individually, uh, sorry, pediatric cancers are individually rare diseases. And that has big implications for our knowledge and understanding of these particular uh, diseases, particularly in comparison to adult cancers or who have a lot more data um, to, to, to have a go at. As you'll know from discovery of discovering biomarkers, discovering subtypes, discovering drug targets, um, more, more numbers is more insight. And so we really need to think about coordinated ways of analyzing, collecting, sharing genomic data which this audience I'm sure knows is large and sensitive and, um, and delicate, tricky to handle and, and share in other ways. So we've been thinking a lot about a federated approach to engage our national partners, to encourage them to participate in the program so we can share data with them easily, but also to drive international collaborations of ever larger data sets to uncover newer and new insights into this disease. Okay, thanks Bernie. So the first thing we did with Biocommons was called the Pathfinder Project, which, which was undertaken in 2022. And that saw us bring together a partnership with CHOP, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and an organization called Seven Bridges, who make a genomic analysis platform called Cavatica. Cavatica is um, designed, uh, it's a genomic analysis platform on the cloud. It's focused on pediatric disease, so not just cancer, but pediatric rare and, and infectious diseases. And its goal is to allow um, seamless data sharing of analytical tools, pipelines, and data sharing across borders. So this project's goal was simple. It was to bring Cavatica to Australia. It's now running on the Amazon Australia in infrastructure. So there's a version running here. Um, we through all that effort and all that engineering effort from Marie and the team have migrated all of our pipelines, updated them to be containerized and cloud-based and using CWL. And we've shifted over our analysis pipeline into production over in Cavatica in Australia. That's quartered our analysis cost, reduced our long-term storage cost. And um, the third point is, yeah, so we get to run about 5,000 real hours of compute compressed down into about 25 real-time hours, which makes it reasonably efficient to run genome scale analysis on the cloud at scale. Um, thanks, Bernie. This is perhaps really obvious to this audience, but I wanted to frame this from my perspective as more of a bioinformatics researcher, that when I think about what is a data commons, I think about a a web ecosystem where we where we come, we, we log in with our secure um, our passwords and be given access to larger and larger data sets. The pipelines flow data into these data commons and it provides a simple user interface to explore the data, access it, and then retrieve that data into your analysis platform of choice. Um, they make it easy for you to know what data you have available, make it easy to drive collaboration, um, and so I, I think that's how I think about a data commons. I know for the engineers in the audience and others that they might think more about some of the, the data technology side of the piece, but as an end user, that's what I, I think about when I'm describing what a data commons is. Thanks, Bernie. So really that's the segue to the next project, which was in 2021 with BioCommons called the Standing Up Gen 3 pilot project where we've been able to, with our partners at University of Melbourne Centre for Cancer Research, we've established several instances of Gen 3 um, as a technology for building data commons platforms and data ecosystems. So Gen 3 is, is a popular, uh, it's the technology that we chose to start with to create a, um, a data commons. As the name implies, it's the third iteration of this type of technology and it's used to empower things like the genomic data commons and other large scale initiatives from the, from the American National Cancer Institute. So it had lots of good pedigree and backing. Um, for me really, again, from my, my perspective as a researcher, it, it helps to take care of submitting and describing your data with, with accurate metadata, controlling access to it, uh, authorizing who can see what, 
and helping to summarize data resources real time on a, on a web page so that less, not even less savvy, but, but different people can interact with it and know what data is available, which is really important for you know, a program like ours that's recruiting hundreds all the way up to a thousand patients a year. It's really important for our collaborators to know what data we've been collecting and, and how to access it. So you can see from the diagrams below that the one on the left really describes the data dictionaries and how the data elements interoperate with each other and how you can describe a data set. There's lots of different data dictionaries, of course. I think this is the Anvil one. Um, and on the right, you can start to see uh, the interaction between this ecosystem with a landing page that describes a back data exploration page where you can find your data um, and a data submission portal. I think the important point here is that the Gen3 platform itself isn't the place where you store your petabytes of data that's stored externally and then links securely into the platform. So don't think of Gen3 as, as needing to be this enormous data store. It links to the places where your data currently lives, uh, which is an attractive part of, of this particular technology, I think. Okay, over. Yeah, next slide, thanks, Bernie. So what have we been able to do so far? Uh, well, I'm pleased to say we've been able to deploy a, a basic instance of Gen3. Um, you can see from the URL perhaps that it's running inside our, our ecosystem at CCIA. We were able to slay the dragons and configure all the microservices, configure all the Amazon and Kubernetes infrastructure to support the platform. I'll talk more a little bit about that on the next slide. It, it was a bit challenging. Uh, importantly, we've been able to enable authentication at the user level uh, via CI logon, which provides the access at your educational email address or your Gmail and the Microsoft 365 suite. So that allows us to authenticate into the platform and not just with our institutional email with, with uh, cause our you know, bio, zero childhood cancer is a national program. So we needed to be able to authenticate um, using different, way, different sort of academic email addresses. We've been able to organize authorization to individual data sets at the project level, which is good, but I'll talk more about that on the next slide. Populated it with some cancer whole genome sequencing data, a limited amount of data just to see how that part of the process works. Uh, more, we, we've all contributed to documentation to help others work out how to launch a Gen 3, and Peter's gonna talk a bit more about their experience later on, because uh, he joined the program a bit later. Um, but, but props must go to our partners at University of Melbourne who have done the, the lion's share of the documentation of how to do this. And really from this, I would say our proof of concept has been achieved that we've been able to learn what it takes to deploy a platform like this and start to use it and see where its strengths and limitations are. Uh, next slide, please. Maybe one back. Yeah, great. So this wasn't without its, its challenges but and opportunities. So the diagram on the right uh, just is a snapshot of some of the um, open source microservices that Gen3 uses. I think Marie nailed it this morning when she described it as uh, not quite out of the box. Um, so we, it took far more effort than we thought it might to get it running. Uh, we probably needed more significant cloud DevOps, ex DevOps expertise within our group to really successfully spin this up. So we had to outsource some of this with professional cloud engineering support, professional security assessment, and fortunately collaborating with Victor at University of Melbourne, who, who really helped uh, make some traction here. So you'll need expertise if you want to spin this up. Perhaps an obvious thing to say is that the default data dictionaries are, are not all that useful for, for most people, I would imagine, but particularly not for pediatric cancer. And if you want to develop your own data dictionary, that itself requires a, a, a serious set of skills, a, a particular set of skills and understanding of data, which a genomicist or a bioinformatician like me or my group don't necessarily have a natural gift in that area. Um, so it's quite a multidisciplinary team that you need to get these things going. Unfortunately, there's no out of the box ability to control access at the individual file level. So I can't grant someone access to five BAM files yet. I gather our colleagues at University of Melbourne have been able to achieve that. So it suggests it's possible. And that's the level of granularity that we'd like to achieve in the data set. Listed here as a challenge is that data access is only via the S3 protocol. 
For us, that's a pro. Our data is on, on a NetApp device exported via an S3 protocol, and we've been working with NCI to do the same. For you, it may be a con if you don't have our S3 export via that protocol. Um, so that's just a snapshot of the challenges, uh, which we'll be documenting and summarizing in another workshop coming up. What's next for us? Really, I mentioned Cavatica is the place where we analyze our genomic data. I'd love to see the outputs from that pipeline automatically loading the results into, or automatically archiving into the S3 bucket and then automatically loading it into Gen3 in real time. So we don't waste too, many, too much human intervention in this difficult part of the process of, of sharing data. We'd love to be able to automatically assign permissions to users and files. So one of the use cases we'd like to support is that all, all data from Hospital X, so Western Australia, our Royal Children's in Melbourne, that researchers from that same hospital, when approved, can access easily to, to that site or to that disease type or to that age range or whatever it might be. So wildcard access to that would be fabulous. We want to automate data access procedures, which I guess is related to that. Um, it's a bit clunky still to, um, to handshake off that this person has access to that data set. Really the big grand goal of the human genome platform is to, one of the big five goals is to query between Gen 3 platforms, which sounds simple, but the devil's in the details and that requires data dictionary compatibility. So you're talking about the same types of data. Ultimately, I think Gen3 does have the potential to solve our data sharing challenges as we expand up to a thousand cases per year. I'm glad we went embarked on this. We definitely learned a lot and we are excited enough to keep trying to adapt it to our process. Next slide, thanks, Bernie. Uh, Last slide really for me is, is uh, the, the great slide of acknowledgements. Again, really big thanks to Camille and Marie who did almost all of the work from our side on this project. I didn't do it all that much at all. And, and big thanks to our partners at Biocommons, University of Melbourne, Centre for Cancer Research, AAF and CI Logon who, you know, we were able to build that really multidisciplinary team across the different sites to support this project. So I've mentioned Victor before and, and Oliver um, and especially uh, Lisa for project managing this. So I think next, back to you, Bernie, or to John, back to you, Bernie. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Right. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, it's a massive understatement for me to say that the Zero Childhood Cancer is inspirational and um, really important work. And so we're thrilled to be partnering with you um, on this, these projects. Thank you for your presentation. Okay, so, um, We'll move on to the next speaker. Um, and uh, as I said, we are very uh, excited to have John Scalland from the Australian Access Federation presenting the next part of this presentation. And John is going to be talking about federated identity and access management in human genomics. Over to you, John. Thanks, Bernie. Um, despite Bernie's assertions about all us being experts in uh, human genomics, I'm definitely not that. Um, but I do know a few things about uh, authentication and access mechanisms. And obviously that's a very important part when you're talking about a, uh, a loosely coupled federation of organisations wanting to access data. Um, so next slide, Bernie. Um, so identity and access management is, is a collection of not just technologies. We tend to get a bit obsessed with technologies a, a lot of the times, but it's also about standards and policies and you know, data access committees and those sorts of things are equally important in that process. Um, so I guess identity and access management is the glue that starts to link all these different organizations um, with the different sets of policies, uh, different data access committees, different tools and technologies and, and starts to combine those all together. Um, Policy is really important in this piece. So um, different organisations need to be able to trust that there's a, a reasonably common set of um, standards and application in terms of the way uh, identities are dealt with, the way access is granted to systems and so forth. So we'll be spending a lot of work uh, in the project I'm about to talk about, just trying to uh, establish a policy baseline to make all of that work together. Next slide, please, Bernie. Um, so some of the challenges that we bump into in this area, um, 
obviously we're talking about uh, genomic data and despite uh, whatever efforts are, are taken, it's inherently identifiable um, once again. So we need to be pretty careful about processes to give access to that data to help protect the privacy of individuals who have contributed samples to different data sets. Um, so there's quite a lot of work needs to go on around uh, things like multi-factor authentication to ensure people are in control of their credentials and also identity assurance to ensure that, you know, when Mark applies for a data set that we know it is actually Mark and not someone else um, that just happens to have the same name, for example. Um, the next point there is around service parity. So the Australian Access Federation has done a lot of work around uh, enabling authentication and access across organisations. And many of the organisations that are involved in these sort of activities are AAF members, but that's not exclusively the case. And we're increasingly looking at bringing in you know, hospitals, potentially government sources of data, um, medical research institutes that may not be AAF members. So it needs to work in a similar way for both kinds of organisations. Um, obviously, we'd love everyone to join AAF, but that's not, um, not necessarily going to happen. Um, research versus clinical use for the data is another important consideration. So the, the focus of the work we're on at the moment is definitely towards research, but we're also thinking about pathways towards clinical usages as well. Um, and increasingly the lines get blurred, you know, samples that get captured for clinical usage can end up in, in research and potentially uh, it could go the other way as well. Um, gaining widespread adoption of solutions is important. So a federation is only as strong as its contributing members. If we've only got a couple of organisations working in the federation, then um, it's not going to be as successful as if there's broad agreement uh, about how things are done. So we, that consultation piece is going to be important as we start to demonstrate solutions and as we, um, as we move forward. There are a range of technologies that can help us. So I, I mentioned that... Um, we tend to get obsessed with this sometimes, but the policy parts are just as important. But we're looking at things like GA4, GH passports and the AAI profile, um, the research auth service from NIH, uh, resource entitlement management systems, and also CI logon that we've been using as the um, hub to combine all these different organizations and different services into a coherent authentication solution. Next slide, please, Bernie. Um, so thanks to Jess for putting this diagram together and uh, she had some help from others too, I think. But um, So we've got a researcher, they, they're going to want to find out about some data and go through some sort of data access committee approval process for that. Once that's approved, they then need access to systems. So all of this comes down to an identity component, um, both in the approval process and when they're actually getting access to data. They'll then need to take some of that data and do further analysis on it. So that's got to get um, connected to different processing systems. They'll then take the outputs of that and then perhaps go through that, that process again. So identity is really the, the central component in some senses or the glue that makes all of this fit together. Um, so we're, we're working on a number of tools like CI Logon as the basis of that, but we're increasingly looking at solutions that are more um, I guess there's some specific requirements around genomic data where we're having to augment those base systems with things like GA4GH passports and um, the REMS system as well for access to, you know, might be right down to particular records in a data set. Next slide, please, Bernie. Um, so this is a bit of a, a diagram for, for where we currently are. So we've, we've gone through a fairly um, quick, but we've got some fairly concrete ideas now about the project planning process. Um, and we're currently in a discovery phase. So that involves talking to the different partners that we're working with. So um, Zero, uh, QAMR, Berghofer, Garvin, and uh, others as well. And at this stage, we're just trying to understand what goes on at the moment. So um, how do researchers come along and get access to data sets that people hold? what sort of checks are in place on identity, um, how is the data physically provided to people once they've gone through a data access committee, what kind of report back processes are there at the end, um, how is the data destroyed, what sort of privacy um, restrictions are there and so forth. So 
we're just trying to understand what what goes on at the moment um, to start to get a picture for those business processes and out of that we'll drop some of the requirements in terms of where are the pain points where are we burning a lot of time going back and forth and requesting similar bits of information again what's difficult for people to provide where the where are the misunderstandings and so forth from there we'll start to look at some candidate solutions so we already know about a number of technologies but we'll start to screen those solutions and what we know about them against the requirements and then we'll start to do some pilot implementation so this is leveraging several projects that have gone ahead. So um, Mark talked about the, the uh, Gen 3 pilot. AAF has been involved with that and um, using CI Log on as the basis for that. And we're gonna take the, the learnings from that and carry things forward. Through this next phase of work, we'll start to look a lot more around um, GA4GH passports for authorizing access and so forth. Um, documentation will also be important in this process. And then at the end, I guess the output is really an evaluation and reporting. Now, although this is presented as a, a cycle or a sort of a sequence of one thing after the other, in reality, several of these stages, if not all of them, will be going on simultaneously. So, um, you know, we, we're doing work on requirements gathering now, but we're already looking at some potential solutions for some of the common requirements that are popping up as we go talking to different partners. So the key outputs for the work, um, uh, initially it's a sort of analysis of the current state, a report around challenges, needs and candidate solutions. Uh, and one of the important things here is documenting rationales for preferred approaches. So um, when the questions invariably get asked 18 months or two years down the track, or well, why did you pick solution X and not solution Y? We've got a record of that that we can go back to. The second key bit of work is development of a trust framework. So this is a set of policies and standards and expectations to satisfy um, sort of the legal and security requirements for organisations. So um, it's, it's one thing when people are coming to you and requesting access to data and you can ask whatever questions you need to to, to ensure that's in place. It's another thing when you're kind of trusting a third party organization to assert information for, to you to make decisions about access to things. So um, establishing that trust framework and making sure everything, everyone's operating from a common set of baselines around principles around how they issue accounts, when they revoke accounts, um, what sort of security review processes might be in place when people are onboarded and offboarded, what kind of identity checks are done when issue, accounts are issued and those sorts of things start to become really important. Uh, prototype implementation. So we don't know exactly what technologies we're going to be working with, but we've got quite a, a smorgasbord of things to choose from. Um, so that'll get guided by the requirements and working with the, um, the genomics analysis organisations to, to work out, you know, where are the pain points and what are the things we really need to look at um, first in the process. Uh, and then a production design. So I guess the output for this is, right, we've done some prototyping, we now understand the problems a lot more, we've tested some solutions out, starting to build a design for this is what a production federation might look like in Australia for um, work on genomics and sharing of genomic data uh, amongst Australians and also it's, um, to international organisations as well where that's appropriate. Next slide, Bernie. Um, so the, the success criteria for this prototype human genomics platform project are, um, first of all, we want people to be using their home institution credentials. We're not going to start issuing new sets of credentials on this central platform. The intention is for people to come from um, hospitals, research organisations, universities, and potentially government, and to be able to just use their ID that they use every day to go and do things at work to log into the platform. We're certainly looking at alignment with global standards. So research is becoming more and more global and there is a need to share these data sets uh, with overseas people who are doing similar research. So we need to make sure that what we're doing is compatible with some of these international initiatives that are going on. Another important factor is that uh, users and organisations indeed can fulfil multiple roles in there. So um, 
if we take someone like Mark, who in, in one sense is a data custodian for the data that they hold, and they may wish to share that with other people. Um, so Mark may need to review as a, a role on a data access committee, but he might also want to request data from somewhere else for research he's carrying out. So he, can he has multiple roles in multiple systems and we need to be able to um, cater for that particular requirement. And the other thing is widespread buy-in from the community. So as I mentioned, this isn't going to work real well if it's only two organisations that think this is the way to go. Um, we need to make sure that as we go through that some of this design solutions uh, socialised with some of the major players and to start to, you know, get everyone to, to buy in and, and agree that this is the right direction to go in. Um, so we've, we're working with four partners, I guess, at the moment. Uh, we hope that will, uh, will grow as time goes on, but um, it's been a very constructive and positive collaboration to this point. Uh, and I think that's it for me. Um, even two minutes early, so uh, back to you, Bernie. Wonderful, thanks, John. Um, yeah, it's a, a really um, important area for the technology and underpins um, everything we're doing and um, also very difficult and challenging. And um, uh, thank you for that presentation. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our third speaker for this session. Um, and as I said, we're very pleased to have Professor Peter Meikle from the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute. And Peter's going to be talking about harmonized data environment for coronary artery disease cohorts. Over to you, Peter, when you're ready. Thanks, Bernie. Uh, so uh, like, like the, the previous two speakers, or perhaps unlike the previous two speakers, um, we're coming in, we're probably the most recent uh, group that's, that's partnered up with the BioCommons team um, to develop uh, this, this platform. We've really only been talking to them in the last couple of months, but we're very grateful for their experience uh, and appreciate their support in, in what we're trying to develop here. Uh, and, and so I'll talk mainly, I think, about, you know, the, the, how we initiated this, um, this project uh, and, and what we hope to gain out of this and what we're trying to develop. Uh, and, and just touch on, uh, you know, some of the, the steps that we go, you know, that we've planned out with the Biocommons team in how we can progress this. Uh, and so, as Bernie said, the, the goal here is a harmonised data environment specifically around coronary artery disease cohorts. Uh, and we're, we're rolling this out, you can see under the auspices of the, the Australian Cardiovascular Alliance and, and specifically the Precision Medicine flagship and, and the reason for that, I think, uh, you know, when we discuss this, it's really to, firstly, to, to bring the community into this development. Uh, that is the cardiovascular research community, because we're, we're relying on those for, for um, the cohorts that we're trying to bring together. But also this will serve as a useful platform, a, a useful vehicle um, to then extend and make available uh, this, this um, coronary artery disease cohort platform uh, to the broader research community around the, the country. Uh, next slide, thanks, Bernie. Okay, and so the context here is obviously cardiovascular disease. Uh, I think most people would recognise that, that despite, you know, really some substantial gains over the last couple of decades in terms of, of management and treatment of cardiovascular disease, it's still one of the major causes of, of mortality and morbidity uh, in Australia. And in fact, what we're, we're seeing is, is that um, while we're getting better at treating cardiovascular disease, we still see that most people who present with a, a heart attack um, present with no prior warning. And in fact, an increasing number of people present with no cardiovascular risk factors, so, so they don't have high blood pressure, they don't have high cholesterol. And this now represents up to 25% of the, the population that present with cardiovascular events. And so it's, it's becoming increasingly clear that we need new biomarkers for cardiovascular disease, and particularly for early warning, because of course, if we can identify patients early in the disease process, there's very effective strategies to uh, to prevent disease progression and prevent cardiovascular events or heart attacks. Um, 
and so over over the last maybe five to ten years, there's there's been a um, a lot of development by our group and other groups around the country in terms of profiling cardiovascular disease patients, um, particularly with genomics and more recently with metabolomics and lipidomics. And we're using this to develop new biomarker strategies and new biomarker panels that we can use. But what we're, what we're seeing now that is that relatively few of those are translating through into clinical applications. And, and I think one of the main um, roadblocks there is that we really don't have the resources to do the appropriate modeling and particularly the validation that allows us to do that type of translation. And so that's been one of the, the drivers of, of trying to develop this uh, platform that I'm, I'm describing today. Um, over the last 12 months or so, there's been a, a number of um, grants that have gone in and some of those have been successful. Uh, these are, are driven either through the University of Sydney or through the Baker um, Institute. And again, the, these have also initiated the, the development and the recognition that we really need to put this platform together. And I, I already described the, the role that the Precision Medicine flagship will play in this. Uh, next slide, Bernie. Okay, and so the challenges then in, in trying to develop this platform is, is firstly the integration of, of this CAD cohort. So we recognise that, that this will add power for both discovery and validation studies. But what, what I've shown here on the, the table there is there's eight cohorts um, that we're starting with in this particular platform. These represent a mixture. So some of the, the first four, the BioHeart and the CourtCAD and the EdCAD, these are clinical studies uh, that have been going on over the last three or four years now. Um, and, and so they have uh, a smaller number of participants that are, that are very well phenotyped, um, often involving not only genomic and, and metabolomic profiling, but also different imaging modalities. The, the next two, the field and the lipid cohorts, these are larger um, cohorts. They, they're derived from clinical trials that were conducted um, either back in the 90s for the lipid or, or a bit later than that for the field study. So again, these have slightly different um, fields that, or, or information that they can provide on, on the participants. And in fact, they, they involve interventions as well. And those then the last two, studies there, the Busselton study and the Oskayev study, these are population studies. So again, quite large uh, by comparison to the, the clinical studies, but again, with, with slightly different forms of, of outcome data, um, often taken from health registries and death registries and those, those types of things. Um, but again, and again, with, with uh, where we've been able to do uh, genomic or metabolomic profiling. So the challenge really is how do we integrate these different types of studies so that we can um, leverage one from the other and, and uh, improve our outcomes in terms of biomarker development, but also just in discovery studies in general. I, I've got there on the, the right-hand side that circular Manhattan plot. Uh, this is a, a lipidomic GWAS taken from the Busselton study where with those 4,500 individuals, we were able to, to do a GWAS right across the lipidome encompassing about 600 individual lipids. And this, this has really been quite powerful. Um, again, done with four and a half thousand individuals. If we can expand that up perhaps to 20,000, then, then we can expect to get a, a lot deeper into that, that um, genomic relationship between with uh, circulating lipid species. Uh, so next slide, thanks, Bernie. Okay, and you know this this slide or the cartoon here really depicts one of the main drivers of, of why we're doing this. Um, we're trying to translate what we've been developing um, in my lab and other labs over the last ten years or so uh, here into a clinical lipidomics platform. And and the concept here starts uh, on the top left hand corner with sample collection, which might be the normal pathology uh, collection, but might also involve novel microsampling techniques such as dry blood spots. That'll go through then an automated sample processing through to the, the LC mass spectrometer to generate the patient's lipidomic profile. 
But importantly, then we need these large data sets um, to use the, the AI-based approach to generate the metabolic risk scores down in the lower right. With those scores, then uh, we're developing a clinical interface that will feed back into both the, the patient and the clinician um, to provide relevant risk information to guide subsequent interventions. And of course, this is not a, a single, um, single process. Once the, the patient goes on to an appropriate intervention, then they can be resampled at a later date to assess the efficacy of that intervention using the same type of pathway. Next slide, thanks, Bernie. Okay, and, and of course, Australian Biocommons are, are, are supporting the, the development of this cohort. Uh, and we've just commenced a, a pilot study that will run from October this year through to May next year. And essentially what we're, we're trying to do in this relatively short time frame um, is to deploy a Gen3 instance and that will enable data discovery, um, the metadata representation using data dictionaries, uh, then data upload and, and download and user authentic authentication uh, using you know, the same types of approaches that were described by Mark and, and John. And so, of course, we're, I think we're lucky in a sense, we'll be able to leverage from you know, the experience that, that the earlier um, studies are developing with the Biocommons team into this project as well. But so we're at the same time, we're, we're defining the common data dictionary to, to bring those different cohorts together. Uh, we'll then go on to perform the security testing and, and um, ultimately develop uh, the platform requirements that will support the subsequent phases of the study. So next slide. So what I've just described is this phase one. Um, we were actually starting with just three cohorts. So one each of the, the population, the clinical trial and the, the clinical studies. So we'll bring those three together over uh, these next few months um, and, and establish and deploy that, that infrastructure. Then phase two over the, the second half of next year will be to bring on all nine of the cohorts that we have access to at the moment but also open up the platform to Australian researchers so that they can utilise that platform by the end of next year. And then we'll go into phase three, which is really to open it up a, a bit broader and bring in additional cohorts. And, and again, uh, we've already got um, interest from a number of groups uh, as to, to additional cohorts that we might bring into this. Next slide, thanks, Bernie. So just to summarise then, um, we recognise that, that the, the current biomarker discovery strategies, um, while very effective, are not really leading to the clinical translation, and that's really identified the need for this, this platform. Um, the, the integration of the, the CAD cohorts containing this combination of clinical, genetic, metabolomic, as well as other omics data can then support that clinical translation and, and uh, identification and, and validation of new biomarker panels and strategies. I think um, the Gen3 platform uh, is particularly suited to, to this type of data. Not only can it bring, bring the different um, omics uh, platforms together, but, but the fact that it's compatible um, with a number of international cohort studies as well, I think will be very beneficial. You know, clearly we'll, we'll be limited by the number of cohorts that we can generate in Australia. So being able to link internationally I think will be very important in this area um, over the coming years. And importantly, I think that, you know, this will be a national infrastructure resource um, for cardiovascular research and translation. So last slide, I think now, Bernie. Uh, again, just, just to acknowledge uh, and thank the, the Biocommons team. Uh, we've, we've had so much support in, in a relatively short time um, that we're, we're very grateful for that. Uh, and then we've got the, the CAD collaboration team, uh, Gemma Figtree in Sydney, myself uh, at the Baker uh, and the others here. But importantly, all this, the cohort study leads and the steering committees of the cohorts are all on board for this as well. And we appreciate their support. So thanks, Bernie. Uh, that's it for me. 
Wonderful. Thanks, Peter. Um, and that's um, really um, fantastic work and exciting. And, um, and as Peter said, we're just um, on our journey with that. And um, um, we're really thrilled to be working with um, the, the CAD Frontiers people. Um, so thank you for that presentation, Peter. Um, I'm just going to say a couple of words at the end, uh, and then we might have some time for questions, um, if there are any from the audience. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about some challenges and opportunities in human genomics data sharing. Um, these points have actually been touched on already by our speakers, so I'm just reiterating what they've said so far. Um, as you can imagine, human genomics data requires careful handling due to its size, um, complexity, and highly sensitive nature. Um, but having said all that, it is difficult to work with, but the benefits to health from genomics and related data are enormous and transformative as already been illustrated by our presenters today. Um, and so with our partners, um, we are establishing and promoting best practice technology um, platforms to ensure human genomic research data is used appropriately to achieve its full potential. Um, we are not always fair yet to answer the question that was the title of this talk, um, I should say this session. Um, however, we are rapidly moving in that direction. And you can, as, as you've seen from the presentations today, um, we are making great strides um, towards that. Okay, and if I can just get my last slide. Um, my slides are not progressing, so I'll just um, speak instead. Um, and I just wanted to check if there were any questions. Oh, here we go. It's moved across. Um, thank you for uh, listening to this presentation. Um, we'll see if we have any questions. I'm just going to look in the chat now and see. So first, I'll start with Mark. Um, Mark, you talked a little bit about some of the international collaborations that you have with the Zero Childhood Cancer Project. Can you comment a little bit more about why it's important to have those collaborations in terms of the analysis power for your work? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so there's some really concrete examples there. Uh, <clears throat> in the first project, we collaborated with CHOP and they have well over a thousand brain tumors recruited onto their clinical trials with matched whole genome sequencing and RNA sequencing data. So we were able to upload and we were able to obtain the Kids First analysis pipeline. Kids First is run by CHOP. We right, use their RNA sequencing pipeline on about 100 of our brain tumor samples, integrate it quite easily with a 1,000 of theirs that they'd already pre-computed. So it harmonized the analysis. We didn't have to upload or download huge amounts of data. It was just the process data at the end, which is much smaller, and then start to perform clustering to discover new subtypes of brain cancers. As any transcriptome analysts on the line know, there are batch effects and um, we use mRNA sequencing, they use total RNA sequencing. So it wasn't quite the smoothest and we've actually just finished sequencing a whole bunch of hours with the same total RNA sequencing. So we're gonna repeat that analysis with, with hopefully the same data type. But the, the point really, sorry, I got in the weeds there, I tend to do that. But the point really is it was pretty darn effortless um, to, uh, to do that type of data sharing. The next is a study of germline effects on brain cancers, again, with the CHOP group, and it was, it was easy to extract that data from their platform. So it just makes data sharing effortless when you've got that reason for collaborating over it and the platforms that make it easy. Uh, there's obviously challenges like clinical data dictionaries and things, but it, it's far easier than without it. And I, could I ask Peter a question? You have an astounding number of, of samples there and there must be disparate mixed clinical data in all of those cohorts. And how, how do you munge all of that together? What are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, look, that, that, that's a good question, Mark. And we're just in the process of, of tackling that at the moment. Um, what we're actually doing is, is taking, a basic, you know, taking a basic set of fields uh, for the data dictionary that will try and merge across those cohorts. Obviously, not, not all fields will merge across all cohorts. Uh, the OSDIAB alone has about 500 fields. That, that's sort of anthropometric and, and clinical. Um, so we're taking the, the sort of standard, you know, age, sex, BMI, clinical lipids, those sorts of things that are easily um, convertible across fields, and we'll start with that, and then we'll, then we'll start to, you know, add depth to that to that data dictionary as we progress and, and you know just see what's possible 
and clearly we won't we won't get everything harmonized but but hopefully we'll get enough harmonized so that that uh, you know the, the data can start to be integrated the specific question Thanks, Peter. Um, and thanks, Mark, um, for your answer. And also for the question, I was actually going to ask Peter the, exactly the same question as well. Um, so I'm glad you asked that one. Thank you. All right. we have time just for one more question. I might just um, ask a question to John, but I was just going to say when I was watching these presentations and thinking through what's going on, the amount of um, technology um, involved here is amazing. Um, and you can see that we're touching on so many different things at once, a very complicated thing to bring together. I just want to ask John um, a point about the um, uh, user identification and how do you think, how are we going to, uh, you know, share data with people overseas when we're, you know, you've got different systems and things. Do you have any thoughts about where that might be going? Um, yeah, so the... One of the advantages of CI Logon is it connects into the International Federation of Federations called EDUGAME. So there are, I don't know, 4,000 organisations connected to that. Um, you know, all the major universities around the world, um, many of the major medical research institutes around the world. Um, we're going to need to get into specific use cases and who's trying to share data with whom, but, um, you know, I'm... I'm not too concerned about that anyway at this stage. I think that's that's one of the easier problems to solve, probably. Right. Oh, it's good to hear. <laughs> um, I mean, the devil's always in the detail, but yeah. you know, at a at a macro level, it's it's not too much of a problem. Right. Oh, that's good to hear. Thank you. Um, I just want to once again thank all our three speakers. Um, Mark, Peter, and John, um, we really appreciate their time. Um, and their contact details are here and their email addresses, as well as mine. If you have any further questions about what you've seen today, um, please um, feel free to reach out and contact us. Um, and that concludes the um, current session for Human Genome Informatics. Thank you for watching.